Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Dive in. If you're looking for a scripture reference, sometimes we have psalms, and that psalm there is actually referencing to the book of Ezekiel, where it talks about the water that flows out of the temple, and it, it talks about how deep it gets. It gets going farther and farther and farther. It's wide. And finally, there's a place where you can't walk anymore. You have to swim. And he talks about the, uh, the waters there coming in. So it's a beautiful song uh, with a biblical background to it. I'm diving in. Praise God. I'm glad that you're here today on this beautiful Sunday that God has given to us. The sun is shining. And uh, we're having some uh, good to have Becca back with us. Becca had to undergo surgery. And she's doing uh, uh, real good. Yes. Getting down the stairs. And then the body. The... Uh, her, you know, I told her, I said, don't talk back to Randy. She wouldn't listen. <laughs> now, she hurt her foot, and so it, she was going to blame it on me. And, and I said, the bad part about it is people would believe it. <laughs> so, so, but we're glad that, uh, that, they're, that they're coming along and uh, making progress. Also good to have with us for the first time, visit with us as far as I can, I believe, is uh, Nancy. And she came, uh, good to have Nancy. Will you welcome Nancy today, sir? <laughs> here with Gerald. And uh, we're glad that they're here in church today. We're glad that you're here today as well in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Sunday that God has given to us. We have uh, good reports and we're believing God for miracles. But let me give you a praise report. Um, 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 Valerie underwent heart surgery last week. Uh, Valerie Ballard, that's uh, Jimmy, uh, and he's a... Uh, uh, it's Jimmy's uh, daughter and uh, Patty's daughter in love and uh, and uh, she had to have open heart surgery USC they thought they were going to replace a valve with a, a bovine valve I told her I'm so glad it didn't happen Valerie I said because you couldn't eat beef anymore be cannibalism and so anyway they got in there and they were able to repair the valve praise God and she should be getting out I think Tuesday this week so give God praise for that What a great day it is to be alive. Amen. And uh, we've requested prayer for those who are sick and afflicted, believing God to work miracles, to bring healing. Uh, and we know that God has the power to heal. And so I want to encourage you um, to continue strong in your faith in the Lord, Jesus Christ. And uh, situations happen in life that are not pleasant, but God is good. And the Bible says, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of all of them. So God is our deliverer, and uh, we continue to pray for Alan. It's good to have his son with us today, and uh, but uh, we're praying for Alan, and we're praying for Ray's recovery, and uh, and we continue to pray for these others, one with Ben and Zella and and um, uh, Harlan, these who are sick, and we're, we're trusting God to minister to them and believing God for for miracles. Linda was here at the nine o'clock service. Uh, ben has started treatment again on, on chemo. And he's running a fever, so we we are doing what we call the family flip flop. <laughs> Linda will cut to the nine o'clock, so Diane can come to the ten thirty, and uh, and we're working that. And so uh, if, if Linda was here this morning; she was in church and uh, was with us for the first service this morning. So, uh, and we're glad that Diane got to be here today. And we're believing yes, God yes. that uh, that uh, God's going to give us miracles for and on all of, all of these lives here. We're continuing on our study of Lead Us Not to Temptation. Uh, in your bulletin, you have that passage of scripture there that says 1 Timothy 2, verses 13 through 14. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about continuing our study on temptation. Uh, I'm taking some time on temptation because of the fact that, uh, that this is the battle that we as Christians face within our lives. Uh, a, a, a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, who's coming to Jesus Christ, wants to resist temptation. And then in Acts the 16th chapter, we have another verse of scripture there, and uh, and that verse of scripture there is concerning the um, the uh, uh, story in the book of Acts chapter 16, uh, and, and the title is "Temptation is a form of seduction." Temptation is a form of seduction, and uh, and it talks about this uh, the spirit. In Acts the 16th chapter, verse 16, it says, It happened that as we were going to the place, now this is Paul and Silas, uh, uh, that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl, this is in Philippi, uh, having a spirit of divination, 
Medes, who was bringing her masters much profit by her fortune telling. The word that is used there for divination is an interesting word in the Greek language. The word is, is a puthon, puthon. And it comes from a Greek mythology of a, of a serpent that was killed by the uh, god Apollo. Uh, and it took place in a region of Greece called Pytho. And from this we get the word python from. So the spirit of divination was a spirit of a, uh, uh, of a python. And, and of course you know how a python is. A python will wrap itself around its prey. And, uh, and, and, and what happens is, is that the prey will breathe out and when, the pre and the pre and when the, uh, and, uh, it inhales and when it exhales, the, the python will tighten around a little bit more so they can't ex inhale as much before and it suffocates them. So we're dealing with temptation as the force that the enemy uses to try to destroy our lives. And we talked about last week by way of quick review of defining temptation. It is a test and trying of our desires. Uh, and it is a latent evil of our fallen human nature. It's the latent evil of our fallen human nature. We are carried away by what secretly controls us. What secretly controls us. We are enticed like a fish to a fishing lure or a bird caught in a, in a cage as Ecclesiastes 9 and 12 uses that illustration, that allegory. And James tells us in James 1, 13 and 15, it says that, uh, that when we are tested or tried or tempted uh, by the evil, that, uh, that God doesn't tempt us with evil, but we are drawn away and enticed by our own strong desires. Or the word that is used there is the word lust, which means that which grows in you and draws you and takes control of you. And when it comes to completion, the result is death. The result is death. It may not be physical death right away, but it could be spiritual death in your life. It, it, can, it can be the death of, of, of issues in your life, relationship. And so we are called upon to, uh, to seek for guidance from God to resist. That's the reason why Jesus put it in the Lord's Prayer. And you know, it's a Sermon on the Mount where the Beatitudes are in there. And he talks about how you live a life that's right before God. But he tells us how to pray. And, and, and this, is the, this is the prototype of prayer. Because this is the prayer that Jesus told his disciples, this is how you pray. It covers all the bases. I pray this at least twice a day, sometimes more a day. Because Jesus said, pray this way. And I, I, I remember learning that prayer in Sunday school. But as I have gotten older and, and the longer I'm in the ministry, the, the more I realize the power in that prayer. And there's nothing wrong with, I mean, praying for Aunt Jenny's gown or whatever. That's not a problem. But... This prayer becomes the prototype of which we ought to build our prayer life around. Because this is the command of Jesus. Pray this way. And we, we find it. And he comes to this point. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we're going to deal today for a few moments uh, upon Adam and Eve. And uh, when we talk about this, uh, let me, Adam and Eve will walk in the garden one day. And, and Eve, you know, she was looking when Adam was looking around. And at times she would try to maybe put her arm around him and hug him a little bit, pat him. And he was fine. You know, that's nice. He was, he was looking at everything, all the animals, everything, make sure everything was okay, distracted. Finally, in her desperation, she says, Adam, do you still love me? Adam stopped and looked at her and says, who else? <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. Who else? It's a sense of understanding that... There was relationship that was right until temptation made it wrong. And so we read these words and we pray, Father, bless your word. As we've read scripture today, let it bear forth fruit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When we talk about temptation, once again, temptation is a form of seduction. God creates Adam and Eve. God warns Adam without explanation. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He just says, don't eat of it. Now, how many of you are parents? Do you remember what it was like when your kids said, why? Why? But why? But why? And your response was, because I said so? And there came a point where you didn't, and this is what God is saying to Adam, just don't do that. Do this. Do everything else. You know, and God's, God's response to us in our prayers is, yes, wait, or I have something better for you. And oftentimes we in our impatience, we, we want to move ahead of God. And God simply says, just don't eat of the tree of knowledge. Because he said, the day that you do that, you'll die. Now understand, these, these were eternal beings who had no idea in conception of what death was. 
But they didn't know that by the statement that God made that it was something in serious consequence. Adam did. And God tells Adam and Adam tells Eve without further guidelines. Now we arrive at this conclusion because there is no conversation recorded between God and Eve. It's between God and Adam. And the serpent is the shrewdest of all created wild beasts of the field. And, and, and you know, when you talk about the curse that the animal, that the snake would crawl upon his belly, uh, it's interesting that just recently, well, in 2012, and it's just really becoming a, a, a study, it's really revolutionized uh, um, the, uh, the paleontology world uh, because of the fact that uh, David Martell, a paleo, he's a paleobiologist, discovered this at a, at a uh, uh, the fossil he'd seen before but had never discovered this uh, at the uh, uh, Schulhofen Museum in, in Berlin, Germany. And it's a skeleton of a, of a snake. It's, it's a fossil. But he discovered, what he discovered in this was, as he looked at this, and he had said it before, but all of a sudden he saw it just like the light came on. This snake, which is the ancestor of the snake, and it's, it, it has common scales like a, like a snake does, not like a lizard, that the snake had legs, had four legs. You want to bring, can you bring that picture up right quick, Elizabeth? There it is. You, can, you may not be able to see it from the distance there, but there are four little legs. Now they said the legs were not used for crawling or climbing, but they were used for grasping and holding the prey. So anyway, it talks about this, and it's a sense of understanding that in the story of the temptation the garden, we find that even anthropology, or not, not uh, paleontology, points out that even the ancient animal had legs. Isn't that interesting? You can go back to the other one because I'm sure people want to eat lunch. But, uh, but it's, it's an interesting situation here because the, the snake is called the Tetrapodophus apolectus. Fancy word for meaning, it's in Latin means uh, four-legged snake. And the idea is that, uh, that the prehistoric snake, as they call it, was a transitional snake. It's interesting that in every culture of the world, do you know what is common? Either a snake or a dragon. Did you know that? The ancient Aztecs. The Polynesians had a, a snake from the water. Aztecs had a snake. China had snakes and dragons. Cultures, even Europe. You know, they talk about knights killing dragons. It's in every culture, just about. That there is some sense of, of, a, of a trepidation toward this snake. Even cultures that do not India, even cultures that are not traditionally Christian or Hebrew. They have this sense of, of, of evil being associated with the serpent. And, and we, we look at this and we find that, uh, that in the story here, that we, we have this dialogue of temptation. And it says that there is no temptation that has come upon you, but such is normal to humankind. So we, we, Jesus understood what temptation was. He was tempted in the wilderness. John gives and categorizes it in, in 1 John. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Luke's gospel gives to us a very interesting narrative. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms because they've been given to me for this time. Well, God didn't give them to him, but Adam had dominion, and Adam forfeited dominion in the fall. So we see temptation that is common. And it's interesting because in the Christian story, Jesus, who is the Son of God, fully God and fully man, is tempted like we are tempted. And the writer of Hebrews says this in the fourth chapter. He said, we have a great high priest who we can come to God's throne with confidence because he's been tempted in everything that we are tempted with yet without sin. Therefore, we come to God through Jesus Christ with the confidence that as he has overcome, we have the power of the Spirit of God to live free from falling into temptation. Doesn't mean you won't be tempted. But if you walk in the relationship with God, he's able to keep you from falling. You cannot stand on your own, but God gives you strength. 
And so it happened that the serpent comes. And, the, and, we, and in Genesis the third chapter, it begins, Now the serpent was the more crafty of all than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. He was the most crafty of all the beasts of the field. And the serpent speaks to challenge Eve, who unlike Adam, has not heard the prohibition directly from God. And, other, and, and there are only two times in the Bible that animals speak. One is in Genesis, where the serpent speaks. The other is in the story of Balaam, who tries to curse Israel, and God makes him bless him. But there is, a, there is Balaam's ass that he's riding on, going to go curse him. Angel of the Lord appears, stops the, the animal stops three times. Finally, the third time he turns around and says, Look it! Don't you understand what I'm doing? He said, I'm so mad at you. He said, I'd kill you if I could. And he said, Look around you. And he sees an angel with a strong sword. And the animal speaks and he says, I'm trying to keep you from killing yourself. These are only two times in the Bible where an animal speaks. And so it is. That we find that this serpent comes and he, and he speaks to her. And Eve is more prone to be deceived since she has not heard directly from God about this specific prohibition. And, and Eve's response to the serpent indicates that Adam has not given full disclosure to Eve as she enters the words that God had not previously said. He said, you know, if you eat of the fruit, you'll die. And Adam apparently says to her, he says that you must not touch the tree because in the day you touch the tree, you'll die. And we find this encounter that goes along. And she encounters the serpent in a seductive wrapping of the serpent around her thoughts and desires, conceiving a, 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 a competing covenant desire against God. The serpent begins to wrap it as if, as if the legs of the serpent grabs her and holds her as he wraps around her mind. And, and in the Midrash, which is a commentary of the Old Testament, uh, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish commentary, it says that the serpent literally drew her and put her into the tree, the leaves of the tree. So she stood there and she didn't die. Now I want you to understand, they didn't know what death was, but the terror that had to grip Eve because she had heard that this was bad and that it would be destructive, not even knowing what death was, yet there was this terror. But when the serpent draws her in to the tree, she doesn't die she doesn't die. The Bible says to us that while she had been told these words in Genesis 3 and 3, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. But God said to Adam, don't eat of the tree. So apparently Adam must have told her, don't touch the tree. Probably trying to tell her, just leave it away. Let's leave it alone. Maybe he was afraid that, uh, that she might eat the fruit. Apparently he told her that they were not even to touch the tree. But when the serpent pulls her into this point of temptation, then he produces the lie against God. In verse 4, he said, you surely will not die. Look, you're alive. You see, oftentimes whenever we yield to temptation, at first we're a little bit trepid about doing, tepid about doing that. But then once we cross over a little bit and nothing immediately happens to us, we have kind of a sense of, well, maybe, maybe it's not so bad after all. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's nothing really that bad about it. You see, sin generally moves in stages into our lives. We begin to question, we begin to listen to voices, we begin to be enticed, you know, it's not the first look, it's the second look. And the third that brings temptation into fruition. It's a sense of understanding what Billy Graham said, that you can't stop the bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. And that's how temptation works in our lives. It is a seductive spirit. The serpent informs Eve that God's attempted to deter her and Adam from the true destiny of what they were to be. He said, you can be gods. You can be deity. He doesn't want you to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he knows on the day you eat of it, it's not that you're going to die, but you're going to be like a god yourself. And you see, when you look at this, he simply says in verse 5, you'll just be deity. You'll be deity. You'll be better than what you are. You see, Jewish theology teaches that humans are the only beings created in God's image as precisely as that they resemble him in being able to do this. 
distinguish between good and evil. A lion brings down a zebra in the wilds of Africa and eats. The lion doesn't make a decision of good or evil. The lion acts on instinct. The lion is hungry. The lion pursues. The lion overpowers. The lion kills. The lion devours. But decision-making process is in us as individuals. We make decisions every day. And we value or we devalue the results by the decision we make. It is interesting because we deal with the subject all around us of what is ethical. What is moral? And morals and ethics have a tendency to transition from societal shifts or generational changes. So that what once was prohibited in one generation is now tolerated in another generation to be fully accepted in another generation. It is a sense of understanding we are abhorred when terrorists behead people. They make that decision based upon their desire to try to bring terror into the lives of others while challenging others to come into the bloodlust of that moment. It is a sense of understanding that we do have the knowledge of good versus evil, right versus wrong. Therefore, we are responsible for the decisions we make in our lives. And the Bible says in James, once again, when we are tempted, it's not from God, but it's from our own enticement of desire. It's called coveting. That's a form of temptation. Desiring those things which we think will be immediately beneficial to us without always weighing out the consequences of the long-term results. Eve was told, you'll be like gods. You'll know good from evil. She did not know what evil was, only good. It was not a promotion. It was a demotion. You see, Eve is seduced by the serpent. Adam follows, and their knowledge produces guilt and vulnerability. It is a sense that first, the Bible says, they were on pole, they were naked, but there was no shame because there was purity. But the moment this happens, what happens is, is that there's exposure to each other. There is this enmity that comes between them, the tension between male and female. And the Bible says that they realized that they were naked and they used of uh, fig leaves to make loincloths. To cover them from that area there. And it, and it said you will know. The knowledge produces guilt. And it produces vulnerability in that moment. They know they're like God. They know good from evil. But now they are subject unlike God to evil. See that's the difference. We may have knowledge of good and evil. But unlike God we are subject to evil. That's why we need a redeemer. That's why we need a savior. That's why we need to give our lives to Jesus Christ. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yes. We're not strong within ourselves to resist evil. Evil is all around us. That doesn't mean we're in a bad world all the time. We're in a good world. There's a lot of good things in this world. But we need to grasp hold and realize that there is a spirit in this world. It's called the spirit of the age. And the spirit of the age is the spirit of Antichrist. An antichrist is that which is against Christ. There will be an antichrist. But there is a spirit, a seducing spirit called the spirit of antichrist that's in this world. And his desire is to exalt everything that is against God above God. And the best way to get at a parent is to get to their kids. If you want to get a mama mad and on the warpath, pick on her child. If you want to get a dad ready to put on the boxing gloves, go after his child. You see, that's exactly what happens. If I can't reach God, then I will hurt God through his children. And so it is that we find this. And it's interesting because the concepts of the knowledge he has is the word yada in Hebrew. It means to know. And the word in Hebrew, yada, means to know. It, 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 the concept implies more about sexual knowledge than anything else. And in the biblical Hebrew, it often means to have relationships that are a sexual relationship and sexual knowledge that enables human beings to become godlike in at least one way the ability to procreate. God creates, humans procreate. It's interesting because back in the 90s, the Seinfeld program was the popular program of America. 
And it was a story of four Jewish kids living in New York, four Jewish adults in their world. And they would meet at this diner. And, and they would be at a table and they'd be talking about their problems or the person that they were having a problem with in a relationship. I want to drop her. And, you know, she just seems like she's always wanting to control everything I say. If I say something, she says, no, this is it's wrong, this is right. And, and, and I think I just, I just can't stand it anymore. And, and he said, and, and, and it's bothering me, and yada, yada, yada. And they say, I know, I know, I know. And everybody got, you know, they put it in the dictionary. It's a new word they created. It's not a new word. It's for Jewish kids having fun with the word yada. I know, I know, I know. People said, oh, and a new word. And so now everybody picked it up for a long time. Like, yada, yada, yada. No. It's a biblical word. It means to have knowledge of an intimate nature. And this is exactly what happens. Intimacy brought enmity. They hid themselves from each other and from God. And God comes to them as they hide in the cool of the day. God would always come in the cool of the day and he would walk with them. Think about that. He walked with them. He conversed with them. There was this relationship. This day he comes and they're not waiting at the entrance to Eden. They're not there as children with smiles on their face in anticipation of that moment when they will be together with God and He will walk with them through the garden and they will talk and He will show them and He will say to Adam, look at that animal I created, name it. Because Adam named the names. I don't know what he was doing when he named Hippopotamus. But he, he had a good, he had a, must have had a bad day. But anyway, it's a sense of understanding that all of a sudden they're not there. Why are they not there? They're hiding. God knows why they're not there. But He comes seeking for them. And what a redemptive story it is in that, you know. Because you find that even after the fall, God is seeking for His own. Have you ever failed? And felt isolated? Have you ever had regrets of wrong mistakes you've made, sins you've committed, and you feel like, I can't face God anymore? And you feel isolated because you failed, because you did something you shouldn't have done. You fell into temptation, you fell into trap. Do you know that God will still come seeking for you? That's grace. He will still come looking for you because that's love. He will still come reaching for you because that's mercy. He comes in the cool of the day, and at the entrance to Eden, the children are not there, they're hiding. And he cries out the Hebrews, Yaakov. It's a cry out, where are you? Have you ever heard the voice of God crying to you while you've hid in the world of sin, while you've hid in the world of the, of the, of the, uh, this, uh, the lie, the world of the deception? God still calls to you. Where are you? Where are you? And so it is, he comes. And God knows what's happened, but he forces them to admit it. Genesis 3, verses 6 through 13, the tree was beautiful to look at. The fruit looked enticing. She ate this. And it said, then Adam ate it. Then both their eyes were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves wine coverings. They heard the Lord God walk in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God among the trees of the garden I don't know, but it kind of makes me wonder if they didn't hide among the branches of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As they hid, in the voice, where are you? Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid myself. You see, the awareness of nakedness means the awareness that God has seen him and now as Adam sees him. Wow. He sees himself. The God who had overlooked it and seen nothing but beauty. Now Adam sees himself in his degradation. And he said, who told you that you were naked? That's Jehovah speaking. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Why does he do that? Because sin has to be faced by the sinner in order for redemption to be applied to the sinner. 
If we confess our sin, 1 John 1 and 9, one of my favorite verses, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you've got to confess in order that you might be cleansed. That's called the new birth. Not being moral, not being a good person, not paying your taxes on time, not, not uh, having a good credit score, not having uh, a civil response, civic responsibility, but repenting of your sin. Oh, pastor, we're all good people. We all just make mistakes. Yes, but you know what? God looks at it seriously because of the cross. God takes sin seriously because he died for the sinner. And as Paul says, I join with Paul. I am chiefest among them. If it wasn't for God's grace, I would be lost. And so it is, we look at this, and he, and he said, who told you? Have you eaten the tree which you commanded to eat? Now here comes, confront it, Adam, face it, Adam, repent, Adam. But here's human nature in the fall. The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, you gave her to me, you created her, hey, you gave her to me. She gave me fruit from the tree and I ate, it's not my fault. God says, yada, yada, yada. I know, I know, I know. You know, I know what you were going to say when you said it. And then he says to the woman, what have you done? And the woman says, the serpent, the serpent. The fat corner on the ground now. Deceive me. Deceive me. So it's the circuit's fault. It's the woman's fault. And oftentimes when things go bad, God, why did you let this happen? Have you ever heard people say that? When they have no regard for God at any other time, but then, God, why did you let this happen? It's a sense of understanding. In 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, Paul says it this way. I am afraid that as the serpent, the word, the word that is old to be state, Deceived, and the word there means wholly seduced, Eve, by his craftiness, by his clever trickery, your mind, your mental thought processes, your purpose decision, the purposeful decisions will be led astray, will be corrupted and destroyed from the simplicity and purity of the devotion to God. In the garden before the fall, there was simplicity and there was purity. God came, they conversed, they were naked, they were not ashamed, everything was fine. Simplicity and purity was in garden, the Garden of Eden. And now comes complexity and destruction. So what happens on this downward path of temptation? First of all, doubt. Into the fleas, no death. Has God really said? You know when people want to commit sin, they start arguing with God and His Word. They start saying, what well, does it really mean that? Have you ever seen people do that? They try to excuse their actions that they want to commit by saying, I don't believe that the scripture really says that. Well, if it's written there, there's a reason for it being written there. It's like saying, I don't really mean, I really don't think that they meant to stop at the stop sign. I did what I thought stop meant. I spun my tires on pavement before I peeled out. I shouldn't get a ticket. <coughs> When God's word says that it's something wrong, there's a reason why God says it. It's to protect you. It's like a cliff ahead. And there's a sign. Cliff ahead. Be cautious. Be cautious. And there's a ranger there saying, hey, don't get too close to the edge. Be cautious. And the guy's walking up there and he says, there's the cliff. I want to run and see over the precipice. The ranger says, stop, stop, don't go there. And the guy says, get out of my way. Don't tell me what to do. It's a sense of understanding that Paul said you could be seduced by the enemy. Doubt. Has God really said that? Well, does it really mean this? Then comes unbelief. When you start doubting, it's followed by unbelief. You begin to start thinking to yourself, well, maybe that's not the right thing. Maybe, maybe that's not what it means. Maybe God's saying something different there. Along with that comes along with doubt, and I believe comes desire. Desire is the sense of you begin to start looking the first time, then the second time. And oftentimes it becomes a predominant thought. 
that you think about and you try to suppress it and you come back and you think about it again and finally you want to think about it because it entices you to covet. To covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. And then it brings to a step of disobedience. Maybe I should just see what it's like. And that's followed by sinful rebellion. You know, we live in an age of rebellion. And we think because we rebel that we are in control. And the enemy of our souls laughs at the calamity we introduce to our life and our interpersonal relationships. Sinful rebellion brings death. It brings death. That's what God said. The day that you eat this, your innocence, your purity will be gone. The simplicity and the purity of this experience with me will be over with. You know what he's speaking about? Not just a physical death. The death of relationship with God. That's why Paul writes about a second Adam. The first Adam was from earth. The word Adam means earth. It means red earth. But the second one was from heaven. As he writes in 1 Corinthians. The first one was earthly and brought death. The second one is spiritual and through his death brought eternal life. Jesus. As an Adam all died. Jesus was fully God, fully man. So as an Adam, he died. His body did not see corruption. His, his spirit went to the Lord. In your hands I commit my spirit. On the third day he arose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. The resurrection tells us that the curse in the garden has been broken by the resurrection into a new garden called heaven. You see, when you read Revelations, it's a full circle. Genesis, you have a garden. Revelation, you have a garden. In Genesis, you have the rivers. In Revelation, you have the rivers. In Genesis, you have the first God and the first man. In Revelation, you have the second Adam and his bride, the church. The parallels go on. It's a story of coming back from paradise lost, to quote Milton, to paradise regained, to quote Milton. It is a sense of understanding that he said that this will happen. Doubt, unbelief, desire, coveting, disobedience. Finally, simple rebellion. The angel excuse emerges here for the first time. Adam blames Eve, and by implication, blames God. And then Eve blames the serpent. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, you have in your scripture there, that for it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But Adam then did it with full knowledge. So we find this sin here. Eve blames the serpent. We are guilty before God. God creates. God sets restricted boundaries. God protects. God confronts when sin takes place. God judges. God forgives and God restores. He knew when they ate and sinned, but he still went looking for them in love. And all through the redemptive story till it comes full circle to a new heaven and a new earth. And you see a tree there whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. And that which was a curse now becomes a blessing. It is a sense of understanding and grasping hold of this that we find out that yes, we are born into sin. I was conceived in iniquity and sin did my mother bring me forth. It doesn't mean that you're a bad child as a baby. It just means that the human nature is in you. And that every child that is born that is vibrant and kicking and, and cooing one day will get old and pass on. But there is a new birth, a rebirth. It is the new creation in Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is past, and the new is gone. You know when God forgives you, it doesn't mean that you may not have situations you have to work through because of your past mistakes or sins. But God forgives you and starts you on a new course. So you can say, well, you know, I'm ashamed because I did this sin, okay? God, was, God still is coming looking for you. God's still looking for you today. Did you know that? He loves you. Well, I, I, I failed God so many times. That's okay. God's still looking for you. He's still looking for you. If God could love Adam and Eve after the fall, 
God can love you and me today. And so it was that Adam and Eve sinned that God says, I'm not going to put up with this. Because in Genesis 3, 16, he talks about the proto-evangelist. The first evangelistic message comes from God to Adam and Eve in their fallen condition. He said this, your seed, not saying multiple, but seed, your seed, will crush the head of the serpent who will bite his heel. It is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ who would die and being struck on the heel by the serpent is a symbol of it. But he would rise again on the third day. He would crush the head of the serpent. And what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden on that day of failure, there's hope. There's hope. And I want to tell you today, I want you to understand, temptation is bad. Temptation is destructive. But there's hope. God loves you. God cares for you. And God will have mercy on you. If you just let him come into your heart. He cries to you today, where are you? I'm looking for you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that in these next few moments that you will touch each heart, each life, and each soul.